Hi, everyone. Welcome. I would like to thank you all. I'm uh, Professor Giovanni Santamaria, Chair of the School of Architecture and Design and uh, NYAT. And I'm pleased to welcome our guests, students, and faculty to this, um, the, the first of this event within the course that the Professor Tom Verabas is teaching in our school. I'm happy to have, uh, and uh, on behalf of our Dean Maria Pervellini, to um, welcome our guest James von Klemper today uh, from KPF for the, um, and I would like to thank him for his participation and for sharing his work with our students. And at the same time, thank you, Professor Verabes, for organizing this uh, um, great series of events, and the lecture and event committee chair Alessandro Meris for coordinating all of this uh, and. Uh, um, um, uh, dealing with also the marketing and Susan Stenberg for the advertising and, ma and marketing help with these uh, events and all the students and guests for participating. I'm looking forward for an interesting conversation and a series of uh, discussions that will certainly enrich our students and their experience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Giovanni, for your introduction. Um, this is also, as, as you just said, it's the first public event uh, of lectures and events in the uh, School of Architecture and Design Spring 2022 series. Uh, it's titled Communities. Uh, I'd like to thank the Lectures and Events Committee as well, Al Alessandra Mellis and uh, Sue Sternberg and um, uh, my colleagues, and especially Dean Perbellini, uh, for her support in integrating the presentations and interviews uh, in this seminar into our Lectures and Events series this spring. Uh, thanks also to uh, MARC Director David Diamond for his support for running this uh, seminar for a second year in 2022. Uh, so good afternoon to our school community, alumni and the public joining this event. Uh, my name is Tom Verabas. Uh, I'm a professor of, in architecture at uh, New York Institute of Technology. Uh, it's indeed a thrill to welcome to join us today, James von Klemper, President and Design Principal of Cone Pedersen Fox Associates, KPF, headquartered here in New York. Uh, this first presentation and student-led interview is the first in a series of six built, uh, six public presentations and interviews within a graduate research seminar beyond the envelope uh, I'm teaching for a second year. Uh, and this mini series of presentations and interviews are scheduled at this time, 12.30 p.m. every second week for the next uh, 10 weeks. Um, researching pioneering uh, architectural technologies and their impact on contemporary practice. Uh, this seminar course at New York Tech explores contemporary modes of practice working at the frontiers of design, production, and construction technologies. The focus of the course is on the architectural envelope as a mode of comparison through six exemplary envelopes, six seminal buildings completed within the first 20 years of this century, and the performance of architectural skins understood as cultural and technical and experiential thermal, et cetera, performance is analyzed and evaluated by students uh, uh, through several thematic classifications. Uh, students are building digital models for the communication of analytical diagrams of each project, also engaging, engaging in readings of our six selected projects and writing their own authored texts on their insights. In this seminar uh, and in these public presentations and interviews, we're investigating six buildings within the cor corresponding six themes. Today's theme, uh, massing and materiality, and the corresponding project is KPF's One Vanderbilt, um, uh, completed in 2017 uh, here in New York City. The five remaining thematic sessions, just to inter introduce them briefly, uh, and their corresponding projects and presenters will include, uh, in two weeks' time, modularity, components, and mass customization. Jeannie Gang will join us for a presentation and interview on, on her uh, offices recently completed Mira Tower in San Francisco. Uh, under the theme of form and geometry, Wolf Trix uh, will join us to share his Museum of Contemporary Art and Planning Exhibition project in Shenzhen. Uh, climate and Energy, Monster and Partners Tower from 2003, one of the older projects in, uh, in our series. Uh, we will be joined by senior executive partner Grant, uh, Grant Brooker and senior partner Rob Harrison, both who worked on the project from start to finish uh, some 20 to 25 years ago. Uh, visuality, cognition and experience, Diller and Scafidia's The Shed Project, presented by office principal and the project architect, Bob Catcher. Uh, and the last uh, of the series, Interaction, Responsiveness and Smartness, 
um, as a treat to end this mini series, Peter Cook will join us to discuss his Kunsthaus Graz project. Uh, and in today's event, James von Klemper joins us. Uh, Jamie received his education at Harvard Trinity College uh, and earning a MArc at Princeton University. As president and design principal at KPF, he leads a staff of over 700 architects in nine global offices. Since joining KPF nearly 40 years ago in 1983, uh, Jamie has planned and de designed projects at all scales. His work heightens the role of large buildings in making urban space, generating strong symbiotic relationships with the public realm in projects such as the one we'll be focusing on today, one Vanderbilt, Midtown Manhattan's now tallest tower with a direct link to Grand Central Terminal, uh, a new Songdo city in Incheon, South Korea, which extends this challenge to the scope of urban planning. Jamie has lectured at Harvard, Columbia, Tsinghua, Tongji, Seoul National, Yonsei Universities, the ESA in Paris, AMO in Lyon, and at Yale, where he had taught as a Sarin and Vizin professor. In 2018, Jamie received the American Prize for Architecture from the Chicago uh, Athenaeum. Jamie chairs the board of directors of the Skyscraper Museum uh, and the Storefront for Art and Architecture and is a trustee of Bard College. Uh, just a few words on One Vanderbilt. Uh, as the second tallest building in New York City, One Vanderbilt advances and innovates the transitory typology of the skyscraper in the city in which it was born, achieving the intellectual deepening or perhaps an, an intellectual extension of what is now called the super tall. In my view, the subtlety and sophistication of this project lies in its multiple affiliations, culturally, theoretically, and historically, at once the project is sensitive to its historic context in both its materiality and its massing. And as a commercial tower, it speaks a renewed language of transparency of the mid 20th century corporate modernism. Uh, and aside from negotiating uh, these terms of historicity and modernity, one Vanderbilt reinvents the relationships of an urban building to its host city. The building communicates a contemporary expression and aesthetic language of a complex and coherent form shaped procedurally from site specificities. One Vanderbilt shuns the autonomy of Manhattan skyscraper and despite consuming the entirety of its small subdivided urban block, this building is thoughtfully integrated and networked into the infrastructural context of Grand Central Terminal through connections made within a complex and multi-layered section. Following James von Klemper's uh, presentation, a brief interview with student led uh, by MARC students uh, Francis Kwok and Kmar Thomas, who will introduce again uh, next to me once, uh, at, once they start. Uh, but for now, please join me in welcoming James von Klemper, uh, President and Design Principal of KPF. Yep. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you, everybody, for uh, allowing me to come and speak with you today. And, and thanks for your generous uh, description of the Vanderbilt project. Uh, you, you described it in many ways uh, better than I could. So um, I'll have to uh, go back to your recorded remarks because they were, they were uh, well put. Um, so let me now, I'm gonna go to a share screen so I can show you uh, some images of the building as I talk about its genesis and uh, what we intended in the design and, and how the construction has proceeded. The building is, uh, almost finished. Uh, these large projects go ahead in, in a way, even if they're one construction phase, there are multiple stages of, of being finished and various aspects of the site and the structure itself and, and the interiors, which are, are just being finished at the top of the building now. So if you bear with me a moment, I will now go to share content, share screen, and then we will start broadcast. And I'll go to my books function and retrieve. I can find it, this little, um, there we go. And you'll tell me in a sec, it will load. Okay, can you see indeed uh, an image of one Vanderbilt, correct? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, great. So this shows you Bryant Park, of course, with the public library in the foreground and our office uh, on 42nd Street uh, is sort of dead center in, in this uh, view, a 1911 building built about the same time uh, as Grand Central Terminal. So I wanna talk a little bit about the urban uh, sort of 
uh, operation, the urban formula, the urban equation. Uh, before I get into some specifics about the building itself and hopefully into some issues of the techniques that I understand your, your class is focused on, uh, and then the, the, the issues of, of wall and the making of the building materiality, we can go also into the, the uh, Q&A period. So this is a sketch which I did early on in the project to imagine from that Bryant Park view uh, what the proportion, the, the relationship to, you could see the little piece of the Chrysler building poking out from the sort of lower right-hand side of the aspect of this building. And 505th, just to the left in the foreground, which was some would say uh, a practice building for the Empire State Building. This is a Shreve uh, and Lambs building of also around uh, just before the First World War. So um, now I, this is a photograph of, of the building in its context. Uh, and it sits in, in a really advantageous location of uh, the crossing of the belt, if you will, of, of Manhattan of 42nd Street. And, and the spine of Madison Avenue. So a more central site in a way one couldn't find. Uh, and we, we can understand here if we, if we take a walk along 42nd Street, uh, I won't go through all of them, but it, it is sort of a, a, line, a lineup of some of the more interesting pieces of architecture of the modern day of, of New York City uh, with McGraw Hill, the UN at the other end and, and here, not far from our site, Bryant Park, one of the greater public spaces of, of, a, of not a very large scale really in, in Manhattan. And then most important for this Vanderbilt project is its adjacency to Grand Central Terminal, which uh, you know, has been built upon in a way by formerly the Pan Am, now MetLife building. <clears throat> and then uh, just a, a couple of sites over from that, the building which in its 1930s sort of a splendor of Art Deco um, makes one of the most recognizable pieces of, of New York skyline uh, and, and a, a partner, kind of a dancing partner with this building. So here you see the site. Uh, the site took maybe 10 years to assemble. Not all urban property is, is easily put together and uh, the developer SL Green Mark Holliday in particular, leader of this company, which has it, most of its ownership of a very large portfolio of buildings right in this Grand Central Terminal area. And as you know, this is one of the two transit hubs of Manhattan. And so a vital, vital importance to our city and our economy and our, uh, our environment uh, because of the ability to, to capitalize on location of public transit. So, that this block was assembled. And to tell you a little of the story uh, of how the design evolved, uh, early on it started as, as a conversation with Mark Holiday. What would you do if a density of, of 20, FAR 20, were introduced in the site next to Grand Central? And so in a summer of, of sketches and charrettes, we came up with <clears throat> a number of ideas based both on what we thought were the important sensitivities to the site but also understanding of the, the function of the building, which is primarily office. We looked at hotel and residential, but given this mostly work neighborhood of, of the commerce of the CBD of New York, uh, the office function made sense. And so at the end of that summer, we came up with six paradigms of uh, very different ideas for the structure, for the shape of the floor plate, uh, for the gesture, to this very important neighboring building, Grand Central Terminal. Um, but uh, at about that time, the owner decided, well, these are all very nice, but why don't we have a competition? Uh, and, and just about the same time, the city of New York, the D Department of City Planning at that time, led by Amanda Burden, uh, were hatching an idea to increase the density of this part of East Midtown, about 49 blocks. And the premise was that this had been the, the business center of, of our city, of our tri-state area, or of our nation. But uh, over time, some of the buildings found themselves underbuilt, disused, with poor ventilating systems, leaky walls. Uh, and so some selection of these sites 
if they were allowed to be built at a higher density, could give way to higher performing buildings in terms of environmental performance, but also uh, commercial enter enterprises, you know, uh, global companies could come to this part of town and, and find the sorts of buildings such as, you know, JP Morgan Chase uh, with the Norman Foster building underway came out of this program. So uh, Amanda Burden and uh, one of her, her lead colleagues, uh, Edith Su Chen, uh, and many others in city planning during the Bloomberg administration worked on this permitting of, of higher density. And so we went back to the drawing board. We, we won the competition uh, soon after this, but scratched out some ideas for a higher density building, taller, uh, with the, the density of 30 floor area ratio. So not unheard of, but close to the highest density of what we know uh, in New York. So at this point, our examination of data, of, of the facts of solar penetration to the street, of uh, the thermal properties of, of the wall and the volume acting together, uh, began to be mapped out by a, a data analyst within our firm, Luke Wilson, who runs a, a very potent department of, of data design <clears throat> and resulted in uh, a kind of uh, exploration that landed us in the direction of this tapered tower, mostly because insulation, that's indirect sunlight, not direct, but, but sky exposure to the street could be maximized. And, and the, the taper allows that to happen. In fact, allowing more sky exposure to the street than the 20 story extruded building from 1916 or so that was already on the site and was taken down for this building. There were also aesthetic uh, uh, inspirations and thoughts about the power and the beauty of the tapered diagonal. The George Rickey, a, a sculptor who lived uh, in Spencertown, uh, New York, not far away from here until the end of his life 10 years ago, or the, uh, the little sort of slashes of diagonals, which we know give energy to some of the oceanscapes, so to speak, that Richard Diebenkorn West Coast painter has made in, in the middle uh, late 20th century. So these then um, sort of inspired and, and, and we worked on one of my sketches, uh, a, a depiction of the building in the section, uh, <clears throat> dwarfing Grand Central Terminal, but you could see that little lifted slice of a diagonal at the base of the building, which opens up in a gesture towards the Warren and Wetmore building of 1913. And then in order to give the building more wind turbulent uh, and wind force defeating uh, edges, uh, a longer topic to go into later on maybe, the building then attained these kind of, these re-entrant corners by becoming two volumes and then three and then four volumes. So this actually does reduce the amount of wind pressure on the building through roughing the edges of what otherwise could be a harmonic motion, but it also gives the building the appearance of something more vertically accentuated with, with a higher aspect ratio of verticality, which, which pleased us. And, and this was done also not in a symmetrical fashion, but like the petals of a rose or a number of other flora uh, 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 structures, uh, this is really a pinwheel of four elements that come together overlapping each other uh, to, to make this, this slendering of form come to the top. And then at the top, in, at, the, at the end of the competition, we produced this little concept model, concept because you can't build something uh, structure and, and wind resistant uh, that's so fine and transparent, but it was an inspiration for the kind of public space um, and the structural lattice work that would create the top of the building. So here you could see at the end of this competition, um, a group of colleagues, a group of, uh, of friends and, and architects working together at KPF who made uh, models of, of both the overall massing and some of the details of the building to, to convey an idea about how the structure could work and how the form could take shape. And this is the resulting then wooden model, which uh, we then, uh, once we were hired for the project, took down to uh, uh, the city planner, Amanda Burden, who had been at that stage almost 11 years in office, 
uh, at the end of Bloomberg. And she embraced it because this was a pilot in a way, a talisman for uh, the, the program which she was launching of East Midtown Rezoning. The, the, the leasing uh, configuration, the, the use of the space inside the building, even though it's the building design is full of diagonals and tapers we saw, the plans are all orthogonal. So from the point of view of planning desks, whether for trading floors for large uh, financial uh, institutions at the base or for smaller office spaces at the top, um, these right angles make a lot of sense. They also then through this multiplication of volumes create multiple corners corner office is something, you know, the more the better in a way for an office because of the double views afforded. The other thing uh, then we focused on greatly, even early stages, face the building, was how to open up more views towards Grand Central. If you look here from the 40, intersection 42nd Street, Madison Avenue, and you see the old existing building, actually a sliver of it also designed by Warren and Wetmore on the left, and then what is, is built today, but in rendered form, you could see we pull back in plan so that you see another 75 feet of Grand Central Terminal plus the transparency through this uh, atrium like lower area underneath the undercroft of the tower, the mass of the tower allows one to see through. And the importance of the landmark is, is politically and emotionally very important to New Yorkers and, Functionally, it, you know, it is the building that, that we rely on as the sort of the, the, the point at which we come into the city, the threshold of entry to the city. So this idea here, clearly shown in rendering form of one of the densest uh, occupancies of site above the base with one of what we hope with, and, and I think is today, one of the most transparent, uh, per, visually permeable lantern-like bases of the building uh, juxtaposes the stone box of the Bass of Caracalla made into a 1913 uh, New York neoclassical building with a building of today, which is as uh, bright and open ex and accepting of views as we could make it. The top of the building was uh, you know, something I studied in sketch and then came to, to uh, a design which then resembles what this rendering became this jostling series of four elements, uh, which through diagonal bracing of the top, mimic some of those geometric themes that are embedded in the section and uh, even the detail you'll see later on of the building. But at this time, uh, the project could only go ahead if Amanda Burden's idea was cemented by the city council, uh, the legislative, so to speak, branch of New York City at the very end of what then was really a lame duck administration of Mayor Bloomberg did not succeed. A lot of complex issues having to do with hotel unions and, and more. But we, so we had to go back to the drawing board and looked at a much smaller building, not a tiny building, but an FAR 20 rather than 30 building. Um, and as we were exploring uh, the new mayor de Blasio and Alicia Glenn, his, his deputy mayor, and uh, a new head of city planning, Carl Weisbrod, took up the kind of momentum and the charge of this first uh, this effort we had made first time around with Amanda Burden and said, uh, let's go ahead with this because among other things, Mayor de Blasio needed funds for affordable housing and other ideas that he had for the city. And this, this building would do a lot to, to help that to happen. So, um, but one of the big drivers politically and uh, planning wise for the project is how public transit works underground in this neighborhood you see the, the dark blue here representing existing underground ways and tunnels, but in blue, lighter blue, is the coming of east side access. So east side access, you can see the tunnels here, photograph taken maybe 15 years ago, of billions of dollars spent to connect rail lines from Manhattan to, to Long Island, new rail lines, so that a train could come in from Long Island and stop and deliver passengers to Grand Central, rather than having to continue all the way to Penn Station. So this east side access, which in a way is a fulfillment of some of the dreams of the early amazing section of Grand Central with so many functions stuffed into one uh, sort of megastructure of its time, including a couple of tennis courts at the top, one of which is still 
uh, in use, never played there, but, um, and so, yeah, we connected uh, this new building to what, as you could see from the previous image, is one of the most section rich buildings in all of New York, Grand Central Terminal, by uh, this, what I would call a heart bypass operation. Um, the ridership of Grand Central Terminal uh, at peak hours in the train segment of its, its path, its, its transit doubles with east side access. The, the spaces and the stairs and so on of Grand Central simply could not accommodate this. So what we do is we triage, we take part of the traffic from under Grand Central, the new uh, east side access to, to open up within months in, directly into our building. So this connection is makes this high rise commercial office building really into Grand Central West. There are uh, as a space and in between for at grade connection built in a slightly different configuration. This was, I think, believe Michael Van Belkenberg's scheme for this. But um, really, this is also a, a triumph of a, a deal between private and public, whereby the the office building was given an extra area of about half a million square feet, which is worth you know, a billion dollars or so, uh, in order to uh, free up and connect uh, space uh, between these buildings. And then the the developer pays $200 million into a fund that uh, you know, it, it builds out into public space and improvements of platforms below grade, et cetera. So the equation of the tower and the station, a little bit like either Velotto or Canaletto, um, but a little bit like this, this image of the Piazza San Marco with the Basilica, uh, in a way, the analogy to the big public building of Grand Central and the company that, to, to the tower that, that we have designed. Uh, so then be began construction and uh, including one of the biggest, I think the second largest pour of concrete uh, ever in a New York project, city project because of the importance of, of anchoring the building and, and ensuring that along with rock anchors the building would sustain any overturning moments. But you could see here some of the huge structural maneuvers. This was a, uh, a great engineer, uh, Edward de Paolo and uh, his firm Severud. Uh, but in order to create the pu public space below, many of the tower forces were taken and transferred uh, and sloped in order to allow for these cantilevers and this kind of liberation of space. As the building went up, it was what is known as steel first project. So usually the concrete core slips up as steel follows very logical way to build. But in this case, steel went first and a machine called a Perry system, Italian technology, created a, a sleeve mechanism that poured the concrete and formed the walls for the concrete core almost automatically at, at, couched within this steel first frame. And you could see the, the steel rising here, coming up towards the top of the building. You see the diagonals, which I showed you earlier in the exterior facade work. Uh, and it's, it's, it, that is a bracing system that helps the building to rigid, become rigid at the top. Uh, but also the, the process here with the mechanical, the structural engineers, both Severed and Thornton Tomasetti used what's known as a Tecla system, which uh, you, some of you may know is a way of creating 3D models for not just the design of the structure of the building, but the execution and the shop drawings of the building. So mistakes are caught and the speed of construction is, is hastened. These sound like little things, but in a building of this scale, um, this the level of efficiency gained with technical coordination of the structural drawing system and the 3D modeling is, is of huge consequence. To, in order to achieve these very cantilevers and this sense of openness of space, uh, again, making the building uh, a kind of a, a giving it a public gesture uh, along the street, along 42nd uh, Street and along the corridor that leads up now to J.P. Morgan Chase. The material of the building, you can see in this last image, the kind of uh, glowing of a terracotta colored terracotta and the soffits of the, the building. Um, it was terribly important to us to make a building that had a kind of material soul, uh, a resonance and a beauty of, of solidity 
uh, and of texture. Uh, so on the left, you can see a collage of some of the spandrels and solid surfaces in the buildings that surround what was initially known as Terminal City in 1920s of the area of Grand Central, but here with, with brick, with stamped copper, with terracotta, uh, it, this was brought the sensibility into the spandrel uh, of our project. We needed to, for both uh, light penetration and market reasons to keep the floor to ceiling quite clear uh, with glass. Um, so it's really in the spandrels where this terracotta occurs. So you can see these convex forms. This was shaped and made up in Buffalo, New York, a wonderful uh, terracotta factory and manufacturing uh, facility known as Boston uh, Terracotta, but in the backyard of, of Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, Buffalo uh, houses. Uh, and so this really gives the building uh, that kind of macro to micro um, relationship, the, the diagonal of the overall building into the diagonal of the fabric of the spandrel. And you can see the prefabricated units going up uh, in the building uh, at, at the spandrel level. Um, and uh, you see how that then is, is incorporated into the soffit. Um, this also uh, echoes a little bit what happens in Grand Central Terminal. I don't think I show images here, but inside, if you know, the Oyster Bar, other parts of Grand Central Interiors, Guastavino, the great Catalan engineer, builder, designer who came to New York and uh, in the period, I guess, 1890, 1915 or so, made these amazing structurally uh, self-supported interior pieces of building that we can find in St. John the Divine, in uh, this, the substructure of the 59th Street Bridge, or here in Grand Central Terminal. So we, we wanted to bring that into the equation. And so you can see here the, the tremendously transparent glass. This is a German glass of silicate, which uh, has almost zero iron in it. So it's the same stuff that you make Leica lenses out of. Uh, and uh, that allows us to make this sort of temple uh, of the entry, uh, the building seen from Grand Central as uh, uh, visually open as it could be. But then in the back, you see those little sort of scintillating diagonal moments of, of, of bronze, and you see them on the right-hand side here, uh, it forms a, a wall of, of sculpture, uh, which was designed by, by our, our architects, our team. Um, we wanted to bring the decorative arts into the building and the kind of sensibility that we see in many parts of Grand Central Terminal uh, into a, a piece that uh, of this building, which could then uh, have a kind of uh, uh, a floating and, and um, a, a delicacy that said something, uh, not literal, but, but evoked an idea of, of movement, of crowds, of uh, some of the, the, the experiences we have uh, next to this transit hub. One of the public spaces, I'll wrap it up in a minute so we can have a conversation, that is so important to create here is this terrace. Uh, it's one little piece of, of, of land or a building surface on the third floor looking down over the viaduct, but it speaks of this kind of multi-terraced section that occurs with the viaduct, one of the few places in New York where traffic is raised up. We intended this as a public space. It's actually more of a building-wide public, not a New York City public, but in the fullness of time, I hope that, that any train rider will be able to come up here for a drink uh, before going down to the train. As you see here, the opening of the building, Mark Holiday there, Mayor de Blasio. Um, this building, uh, the, 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 the techniques of construction, uh, I can't even go into at this point, that the process and the, the engineering and the, the sort of industrial design aspects of, of the construction process itself and its scheduling. The building finished ahead of schedule in the COVID period, which is really uh, amazing thing. Um, then finally, at the end of the, of the life of the construction period, and really afterwards came this very special piece of the building, which is what happens at the very top. It was our determination that the top of the building should not be private. It shouldn't be the lair of the biggest hedge fund or the richest banker or the smartest lawyer. I mean, that's nice, but we wanted this to be a place uh, the public could enjoy. Now that wasn't really our say so in the end because 
the forces of money are are very powerful. But we got our way because, uh, as it happened, um, Mark Holiday uh, uh, worked with a a very interesting uh, uh, space designer, interior uh, imaginer of 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 uh, public space and public events and public amenity. A man named Kenzo, he goes by a, a single name, and and he made this sort of hall of mirrors, uh, which, as you can see from the image, you can't really tell where you're standing. So, this makes the top of the building envisioned, and you saw in the beginning, it's this crystalline form in the clouds, um, actually achieved that that kind of aspiration. And uh, interestingly, and again, not at all our doing as architects, but. Uh, the revenues that come from all the ticket sales of this little piece at the top of the building equal 20 to 30 percent of the net operating income of the whole building. So, you know, if the, this part of the building can pay for itself, which it does, then it can allow itself to become uh, accessed publicly. Granted, you have to spend 30 bucks, but there's an idea of uh, this sort of, uh, for those of you who remember your architectural history of the 20th century, Bruno, Bruno Taut's Stadtkron, uh, you know, the idea the glass of the top of a building could be in a way a model for a modern city. Uh, uh, you know, we, we lucked out here with this uh, wonderful piece of, of top of building. So with that, I will uh, stop the slides and um, there we go. And return to uh, join you on, on Zoom. Thank you so much, Jamie. This is really a, a wonderful presentation. Really, I thank you for your generosity. Uh, you've really shed light on so many issues that we've been talking about in our in our seminar here. Uh, issues of the massing and how it was generated and its effects, the materiality, the visual presence, its relationship to history and the public integration of the building on many levels. Uh, I, I won't take any airtime, any more airtime for myself. And I'll pass, uh, uh, I'll introduce our two students who will ask uh, some more structured and formal questions. Uh, I'll introduce uh, Francis Kwok and Kmar Thomas. So I'll shift my, my screen over um, to you guys. Guys. Hello. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Francis. And my name is Kmar. Uh, great. So thank Hi. You. Oh, sorry. Good to meet you. Yeah, great. Thank you. So thank you for your presentation and for taking the time today to talk to us here at NYIT. Um, we have developed several questions as part of our study into the um, Vanderbilt um, project. We're in the historical and cultural and disciplinary context of New York City. One of the more notorious, uh, I mean, New York City, the birthplace of the skyscraper and still serving as an ongoing fertile experiment, mental laboratory for high rise design. So one Vanderbilt project successfully negotiates this history and charts a trajectory for the next generation of innovations of skyscraper design are also known in the contemporary in the contemporary vernacular of New York as the super tall. One Vanderbilt is the second tallest office building in the in New York City, one of the more notorious so-called super tower, super tall towers in Midtown East. One Vanderbilt has been designed through rigorous testing and evaluation methodology which you have project, um, presented and is by now well published despite the project's many great mer merits there have been concerns by the public and architectural community over the phenomenal of the typical of the possibility of it limiting daylighting creating shadows and affecting the environmental quality on the ground can you share with us your position on how typical powers can be ecologically responsible. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, and, and I'm glad you're you're launching with a, a critical question because it's important that we are critical of our own work and and we look at the world critically as architects. Um, 
and uh, there's no doubt that uh, it, it when the building was uh, of Warren and Wetmore was was demolished on site and there was an empty site. I was tempted to write a letter to Warren Buffett asking him to buy the site and leave it as a park because it was a beautiful space. We could see Grand Central for the first time from the West. And in a way, as, as the public, we'd be better off. But unfortunately, he didn't read my letter and I didn't have a billion dollars. So uh, but I think there's another there's another serious uh, note, which is that high rises are uh, are very particular and and very intrusive buildings, where we place them and where we decide they're uh, appropriate and where city planners decide is terribly important. They do not belong in many parts of many cities. And uh, so to draw a contrast to, to, to make this building the hero, I can mention you know some of the buildings on Central Park South that are residential buildings of apartments anywhere between 20 and $220 million, believe it or not, that are, are uh, many of them somewhat empty because they're seen as investments as opposed to places to live, cast shadows on the park. What is the public good? Here, however, I make the argument that uh, next to a place of public transit, uh, that's where you want density in the city. Uh, the graph of density wants to go up where most people can come in without using cars, without using excess energy. Uh, so whether in Hong Kong or uh, really any city that, that, that tolerates a tall building, even in the city of London, I think maybe went too far, but in the direction of high, but, but still um, it makes sense to, 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 to build up where we have transit connection. And uh, ultimately, the cities uh, that, that make our economic centers, they need to have engines, engines of exchange of ideas, of commerce, of education. And a high rise building accentuates that kind of density. Not everywhere, but in this place, if you're going to choose a spot right at the crosshairs of the coming together of, if we're, if we're a body, back to the belt analogy, it's the navel of New York. And in that sense, I think it, it environmentally, uh, in terms of transport, energy use, et cetera, it, it, it has a, uh, makes good sense. From other perspectives, wish to consider the impact of a tower is to evaluate the relationship of a discrete tower to the immediate urban context. One or one Vanderbilt argues quite successfully for the regeneration of Midtown East. The complex section of the building is in fact a urban and infrastructural section. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Demonstrating its multiple network connections on ground and below ground to the trains and subway system on, within and under Grand Central Station. Can you share with us how the relationship had come about to take the network configuration as built between private investment into a discrete building and its connection with public space and the infrastructure of the city manifest through the partnership with Grand Central? Yeah, so I'm not sure I caught a question out of that, but that's, I can make it into a question or observation maybe. Um, <laughs> You know, because right now we, as many architects and planners and citizens are, are looking at Penn Station. Penn Station is a great example of failure to, uh, to protect our history. You know, the, the ruining of, of the McKimmead and White building in whatever it was, 1963, demolition. Um, but also the replacement of a really uh, very uninspired, if not soul crushing, building of uh, uh, what's there now, which is a, a train station in the 60s. So the reason I bring this up is how are we ever going to improve one of the most important parts of our city, the other transit hub? And now the proposals afoot from private developers, from Amtrak, from the Empire State Development Corporation, from others uh, to increase density to be able to pay for 
the improvement of this area. Now, whether the uh, uh, equation is fair, is correct, I, I won't you know, guess right now, it's a complex issue. I think the, the, the density of that proposal should be decreased. And it actually was in the, in the last stages, it may decrease again. Um, in, 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 uh, but it did take a step down in Governor Hochul's uh, uh, resumption of that plan. But what I'm trying to get at is that there is a kind of a public private uh, in our country. Every country is different. Every economy is different. In London, you know, we, they, the British public and, and great architects can build HS2 and, uh, you know, new St. Patrick's uh, King's Cross, uh, you know, allowing direct uh, high speed connection uh, rail to Birmingham and, and, and then all the way down, you know, the, 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 the Eurostar. That's fantastic. We need better public transit. That's good for our planet. Um, but in London, which is the headquarters of everything, and, you know, it's, it's the capital of the country. It's one of the great, you know, centers of the world in market terms. New York is the capital of nothing, not even New York State. So legislatively and funding wise, we can't seem to advance uh, the process of, of funding what we should spend money on. You know, various other parts of the world, you know, Shanghai, you have a better high speed rail connection to Hangzhou. In Paris, you have a better airport connection to the city. London, you have the padding con connection. In our culture, in our society, we don't do enough to, to reinforce our infrastructure. So architecture, which can help to pay for and sponsor infrastructure, you know, is, is something that we should be really serious about pursuing. And for its small part, Vanderbilt is, is a piece of that puzzle. And, and I hope we can learn positively from it and move ahead to, to, uh, to Penn Station and do something extraordinary there to make New York a better city. Uh, I'm gonna take one more question. I think I told you, Tom, before I had a, a client presentation starting in like five minutes ago, but they could be, I could be late to that, but could I take one more question? I'd love to, and I, I wish I could spend the next hour with you and I'll come back later on informally to speak with the class. It just, uh, you know, uh, had this uh, silly project lined up. But anyway, um, is there another question or another comment from, I don't know if anybody from, from yourselves, the students, from Giovanni, from anybody? Um, we have a question. So can you share with us the lineage of the project at DPF in the portfolio of work before the Von Vanderbilt project, which had led to its design? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I, I came to New York uh, as a student uh, after years at Princeton, hoping to I actually went to work with Stephen Hall and tried to open my own office. I never wanted to work at a large firm like this, but you know, a friend of mine came to KPF and, and, and told me that, to come and join. And so I came to a firm that made the high rise building its focus. Uh, again, it wasn't my great interest in life, but I kind of got more and more interested. Bill Pedersen, who was our founding partner, um, had the idea that you could take a very common building type. After all, many office buildings were, were uh, you know, let's put aside the greatness of Seagram's and other buildings, but there are many boxes of office buildings were just commodity buildings, like a loaf of white bread without anything much to offer in terms of public space or architecture. Bill took the, the building type and worked on it in a way that brought it into a kind of dialogue with its spatial context and its social context. And that became the work of not most of our firm, it probably is about one third of the work of our firm. It's a very strong strain of studying, advancing the techniques of the building, but understanding the design potential in broad terms as well. So as it turns out, we have designed six of the 11 tallest buildings in the world standing today, which is really more than, more than we should have of a share, but it's because we're, we're excited by the topic. And, uh, you know, every high rise building is so particular uh, needs to almost start over again with a new set of, of parameters. And yet we all stand on the shoulders of those who came before. So understanding the steel frame, understanding from engineers, great engineers such as Les Robertson, who sadly died a year ago, who at age 32 designed the World Trade Center as a young, you know, whippersnapper from the Northwest but a brilliant thinker about 
forces and dynamics of high rise buildings. We learn from less. And so, you know, in our practice, there is a real integration of, of engineering, uh, of spatial design, of uh, construction process, of the finesse of materials. Um, you know, it all comes together in a whole, I believe a holistic way. Um, and so, you know, we're able to, to sort of move ahead in this lineage of one tall building after another, um, but always thinking that, that the tall building has a frontier ahead of it to, to define new tasks. One of the issues I think now being most interestingly explored in the tall building is the vertical green, bringing public space and green space up into uh, not just the lower parts of the building, but higher up in buildings. And Vanderbilt has that nice little terrace, but then a uh, building that we've designed and now built in, in Singapore, Robinson Road, brings uh, green space and park space to the midsection at the top of the building. So the idea of greening the city is something and allowing uh, the enjoyment of public space to be had with plants in high rises uh, is, is being advanced now, I think, in, the, in many practices I see around. So if, if you don't mind, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to run off, but, and thank you for this opportunity, but I propose if I can be of help, I would, if you give me any little spare time on the side, you know, it doesn't have to be such a grand uh, you know, event and audience, but I'd love to come back and just talk about uh, some, some, really your question about the high rise building in the city even Tom, if you have you know some some off hour for the class, I'd love to join you and, and hear more of your thoughts that would be uh, on the topics. Really, thank you for that generosity and for your interest to talk to us uh, today. And 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 again, that's really wonderful. But really, thanks for sharing your presentation, uh, for your time, for this brief interview. Uh, we wish you well and look forward to uh, the further impact of KPF on the skyline of New York City and public spaces and many other cities as well. So. Thanks so much. And Th thanks a lot. Hope to see you guys on, on a review or come and visit us in the office. Now we're past the Omicron, but very nice, Tom, to be to be linked to your great program and Giovanni and others. And uh, we'd love to continue the relationship and build on it to work together. Thank you very much, James. Okay, all the best. Thank you, Tom. All right. all the Thank best. you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.